So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome now Stefan Benish. Welcome, Stefan. Welcome. The floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. So, I'll speak in English, makes it easier for all of us, I guess. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure being here. By preparing this lecture, I tried to figure out what I could say about daylight, since I'm a practicing architect and not a lighting engineer, daylight engineer. But I have worked a good share of my projects together with lighting engineers. So I started trying to understand what this is all about. And I'll first, I've structured it in a way that I first try to, to understand what light is about, especially in context of architecture. And then I'll show you some examples how we have implemented these ideas into our buildings. Due to the nature of things when developing architecture, most of the stuff I'll show you, the the ideas I'll show you are in planning or are ideas, and very few are implemented. First of all, in the beginning, when you develop the ideas, they are raw, they are clear, they are uncompromised. That's number one. Number two is, what, if you're an architect, or once you have finished buildings, they become less interesting. More interesting is, when you develop new ideas. So, next, oh, thank you. This is a cloudy sky light. I first want to, to show you the different qualities of light, how we experience them. And there was a quote from Louis Kahn, which I think is very important. Light is invisible. Light is only visible if it is reflected, hits a surface, or anything like that. We don't need to go in the physics of light now. But here, for example, Istanbul, light, evening. Here, Bavaria, light, evening. Here, Norway, mid-Norway, 1st of January. You barely see the sun. Very clear light. Here in the Sahel, very dusty light. And it doesn't really matter if it's morning, noon, or afternoon. The quality is always almost the same. And here, Death Valley. And I gave you the latitude. It's quite interesting where it is because the latitude is not that important as it is if it's oceanic climate or desert climate, continental climate. California, light afternoon. And here, the Roden Crater, high altitude in the desert, cold winter day, February. You probably know all this. That is James Terrell Eclipse. And that was the first time I understood personally when I saw these. Normally, it's hard to photograph. It's impossible to photograph, actually, really properly. But when you have the right climate and the right humidity, means no humidity, this is pitch black. This is not even blue, because you only see a little bit of the sky. And if no sunlight is reflected during the day in the air, it's dark. You see the black sky, which I found very revealing and interesting, because it tells us that light, whatever we see, is only visible when it's reflected. Otherwise, you see just a big black hole in the sky. Light 
is depending where we live, a problem, the sun is a problem, but it's also a necessity. We need it to see, but in some areas of our world, we try to black it out, to keep it out, but still try to bring it in to see. And here, that's a great mud mosque in Jene. They have done it, have found a fantastic solution. What you see here, all these little caps on the holes can be opened. They take it off and then you have the light in the room. So they found a way to block the sun out, but still get the light in. Now, today clients would say too high maintenance if I have to send someone on the roof to do that all the time. But it's a fantastic space. And here, this space starts to glow because you get the indirect light and not the direct sunlight, the indirect light in the space and it starts glowing. It's pretty dark, so the photograph is high, a high quality photograph. Let me talk about light. What I started out, when do we see light? When can we have light as an experience in spaces? I, as an architect, are very interested in the sensation of light, the experience of light in the room. There's the technical aspect that you need a certain amount of light on your table, the looks, the regulations and everything. But even if you fulfill all that, it's not especially a, a quality room, a quality space. The quality architectural space is when the light hits the walls in certain spaces, the ceilings in certain spaces, and so on. This is an interesting room, but for every day's use, it has almost too much light, too much glass, too much contrast, too dark ceilings, too bright facades. It's fantastic as a space with a flying roof, but for everyday use, it would be too much contrast in here. So in Antelope Canyon, there's a famous spot where they throw for the tourists dust up, and then suddenly you see the ray of lights. And after a while, the dust is gone, you don't see the light again. Then the Pantheon in Rome, you see the light because I wrote humidity. Actually, it stinks in this space because there is no vent ventilation. It's pretty bad air. That's the reason why you see the light. Otherwise, you wouldn't see it. That is Los Angeles in 1985. Fantastic light, but man-made. It's smog. Rainer Banham once wrote in a book about the five ecologies of Los Angeles. He said, Los Angeles is a city with the most beautiful man-made sunsets. <laughs> it's gone now, but it was in the mid-80s. Amazing. And then we have the technical means to do that. We, and I'll show that briefly, we try to make the light visible with a mobile of prisms to really get the sensation of light with reflecting surfaces or with translucency. That also makes the light because then suddenly the building element starts to glow in the light. That makes the light visible as well. And I'll start with that the translucency and the immateriality of light. At, hmm, that was a building we have done in Hamburg, a house in house in the Handelskammer. And my father, that was a competition my father still had done and had won the competition with a transparent building, transparency. In a historic hall, the building shouldn't disturb the hall, but it should double the space in the hall, and it actually shouldn't be there. That was the idea. That was a competition hard to do. So 
he came with a transparent building, but once you go into structure, into fire protection, into code, into everything, there is no transparency left at all. So we switched, my father, after he retired, gave the project to our office. We switched that from transparency to immateriality. The idea, and that's a view from the bottom up to the ceiling. And why I'm showing that to you is, we worked with reflection and with light, with artificial light. Now, this building is 10 years old. That was the first building which was totally done in LEDs. 10 years ago is quite a while for LEDs. We found a company that did set the LEDs in plexiglass tiles for us. And you, what you, it's 180,000 LEDs or something like that. And you see that from the bottom. So you can see through. And the idea behind it was, what's the most immaterial we could imagine as architects? And it's not easy, because we as architects are usually working with concrete, steel, bricks, which is very material. So the idea was, how can we get that immaterial? And the, uh, and the answer was light. Light, not getting into physics, but how we perceive it, is the most immaterial element we can imagine. It appears, it disappears, it changes. One of the qualities of the light is the changing sensation, especially daylight. So here's the view from the bottom up. And that was the idea, to work with, we would say, d'oeil, to work with the reflections, the idea that you see the historic building at the inside and the new building from the outside through the walls. And here you see the walls. You don't know, are you inside or outside? Actually, you are inside. And the historic building you see in the background is pure reflection. It's not reality. It's a torn day with double reflection through these um, polished aluminum elements. And that's the building, Handelskammer. I think it succeeded in hiding the mass. It's more than double the space, it houses more than double the space from the hall itself. Making light visible. This is the Genzyme headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's also 15 years old. But at the time, that was our first building in the United States, we were fighting with the American fat floor plates. We are used to floor plates of, let's say, 15 meters depth. They have 60 by 60 meters, 40 by 40 meters. And for me, as a European architect, it was incomprehensible how you could work in a building like that. So what we did, we accepted the floor plate because it was given by the master plan, but we carved out the building in the middle. We did a donut. Since the outer form was strictly given by the master plan, we started to design the building from the inside. We created what you see in bright yellow to the right, the void, the inner element of the building. And it's, after all, 13 stories high, so it's a pretty high building. And we worked with Bartenbach Licht Labor at that time on this building, and Burrow Happel, Tony McLaughlin, was helping us. It was the first lead platinum building in the United States. The, and then the idea was, how can we make light visible? We knew we could not bring enough daylight in there to create an environment where we don't need artificial lighting. It was just too deep. So we said, but at least we want people to experience the sensation of daylight. So we, we, create, we designed seven heliostats on the roof that reflected the daylight to fix mirrors, 
and then down. Important was we had to block the direct sunlight out to avoid overheating. And then to make the light visible, we did a big mobile in of prisms in the atrium, and I'll come to that. That gave us two, and the atrium is the air return, so they were constant, of the whole building, so they were constantly moving in there, or are constant, the building still exists, are constantly moving in there. This is a model about that size, because we didn't understand the space. We could not understand the space. It was just too complex, because it was also all the stairs going through and so on. And what you see in the background, the lamellas, are vertical, polished lamellas on motors that rand seemingly randomly move. And the idea was to, to simulate the sensation of change in the light. Because the beauty of daylight normally is you see a moving cloud. Then it gets darker and brighter. A tree moves. I mean, it's, it's not static. But once you channel daylight through heliostats, it's static. It get, just gets a bit darker or brighter. To get the statics away, we introduced these lamellas and had one of our interns write a little routine how they seemingly randomly move in there. And it actually works because you're sitting in the corner of the building and suddenly you are in the light. And then the light moves away again. So you have this constant change in the building. And this is how it works technically. It's a machine. And for me, it was an interesting experience that we had to create a very high-tech machine at the time to get something romantic like daylight in the building. It's a bit odd, I do admit. But it, it became a very good space very, with good light. And that's the view down. And at the bottom, we have a big water pool with polished stainless steel that flows and glitters all the time. And that also brings reflections back to the ceilings and to all the other elements. So what you see here at the end of the stair at the bottom is daylight broken up by prisms that constantly wander through the building. For us, that was the first building where we consciously tried to bring daylight, not by light enhancement, just to have better reading light, to bring the quality of daylight technically in a building, because we had no other choice. And given the fact that we were given a master plan that was about as attractive as this box <laughs> yeah, for a building, and I'm not good in boxy buildings, I have to admit, I'm not good at all in that, we focused on the void of the building and on the light. These are the moving blinds. And that's the building from the outside. It's a double wall. And we gave it curtains to give people the opportunity during day or also at night to create their own window in the building. Yeah? All glass buildings are sometimes not even very comfortable at the inside. So if you have curtains to say, I create my own window and at night close them more, at day open them more, that's very comfortable. Surface reflection. How can we bring light in a room without all these technical means? Now, this is a smaller building. This is not as big as the other one. This is the city hall in Bad Eibling with a library in it. And 
a central space where we wanted to bring the light in. We wanted it to be almost the extension of a public space. But without any heliostats or technical means. We worked together with Transola on that, and they did simulate for us the whole space. How can we bring the light in? And here are the different simulations, but I think that is Im important. They gave us exactly how the surface should be broken and what reflected, uh, grade of reflect, reflection would we need on this wall. And there were many models also, big models, to try to figure it out, how it works architecturally. This is during construction, the wall, the faceted wall. One big reflection, reflecting wall doesn't do it really. It brings light in, but not necessarily quality light in. So the broken up really helps us to lit elements of the building, uh, break it in the building, bring it in the building, and also get a, a better quality of the visibility of the daylight. And that is, the, you see, it's Bavaria. And, <laughs> and that is the finished space. So all these broken surfaces really reflect the daylight in the depth of the building. Light enhancement. That I found in Sweden, in Stockholm. I thought that was fantastic. Instead of shutters, they use polished steel shutters that are mirrored in an old building to bring the daylight in the building. But also, and it's fantastic if you're inside, you can see the main street. Yeah? You don't see the building across the street you see the main street. So it's a very nice way to deal with an urban difficult situation. And now I'm showing you a building where we did daylight enhancement. It was, it was sort of funny. We were approached when I still had my office in Los Angeles. I closed that 2014. We were approached by the city of, Los, of Santa Monica if we would be interested to do a parking structure for them. They had to redo all their parking structures because of new seismic codes, plain and simple. And my partner at the time, Christoph Jansen, wasn't convinced and said, ah, parking structure, da, 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 da. I said, well, actually, there are no trivial building tasks. There are only trivial executed building tasks, plain and simple. And especially parking structure in Los Angeles. I mean, come on. These are the cathedrals of Los Angeles. <laughs> so we said, OK, we are interested. But let's do, try to do something special here. First of all, what is the problem of parking structures? Social security, safeness. Usually you are in a dark space, you go in an odd elevator or in an odd stairwell, it's not safe not a safe feeling. And you can put as many cameras as you want in there. And you can play music as much as you want. It might help a bit, but it's not going to change it substantially. So we said the public realm must extend on the outside, visible for everybody, all the way up. That means the way from and to your car should become part of the social control of the public realm. That is the big red stair at the outside. And to make people use the big red stair, we made it very simple. We did put in very slow elevators <laughs> and very dark and unfriendly escape stairs. <laughs> and it works. People are using it. And the way, you know, Los Santa Monica is funny. I mean, every, 
every Saturday morning you go to the nearest sta Starbucks and the big SUVs roll up and people come in trainers, yeah? <laughs> fitness, go drink a coffee, talk about the last marathon, go in the SUV and drive back. But some of them actually run, and it became a sport here at the parking garage, Saturdays running up and running down again. <laughs> but light, we are talking light. And the ground floor is retail, not parking. So it's part of the city. Talking about light, we said, hmm, wouldn't it be nice to have a parking garage that actually has daylight? And they. They have solar voltaics on the roof, and they have electric charging stations, everything, but normally not daylight. And they had redone some of the parking garages with beautiful facades, but they don't do anything except being look like the newest Bottega store or something like that. You know, beautiful facades, but pfft. So we, we worked together with Transolar and Bartenbach on that and said, how can we bring real daylight in a parking garage. And it's actually, it's a fantastic parking garage because you'll see, you oversee the Malibu, the coast. I mean, it's stupid to not live there, to park cars there, but that's the way it is, not our choice. So we did all the sim simulations throughout the year. And the parking garage itself is exactly north-south oriented, looking west over the ocean. So we said, hmm, would be good to capture the morning sun till, let's say, 2 or 3 o'clock, and then let the sun directly in. And that's what we did. We have these elements. You see it here. Above the stair, we have folded polished metal as mirrors. And these elements are folded out and reflect the daylight in. And they are punched. In the afternoon, you get the direct sunlight in the building. But until 4 o'clock, the daylight is reflected into the building. And here you see from the north, we gave it the colors of, that are predominant there. You know, afternoon colors, sunset, and so on. And if you see it from the south, you don't see the colors, you see the mirrors here that reflect the daylight in. Yeah, we could discuss it. Is, ne is it necessary to bring daylight in a parking garage? But on the other hand, why not? If you can do it, you should do it. <coughs> Talking about sun protection, another element. In the north, we don't need very much. But in the south, we need a lot of sun protection. To avoid overheating the buildings, that one aspect, but the other aspect is to, to avoid contrast, to have a good quality light in the buildings. And these are some examples how you can do it. And I just didn't mention the Venetian plants you usually have. I mean, that's always possible. But I thought maybe we find another way, and that's what we are working on right now. And here are the different examples. My favorite one is the deep screen in Palm Springs City Hall. Uh, it's, it's like garbage cans hanging in there, but it's absolutely fantastic. I don't think it works very well, but it's absolutely fantastic. Then a good example, yeah, we have the awnings, we have the fritting, and a beautiful example is um, the parking structure of site in Miami. It's a 80s building, which has just planting all over it. It's absolutely fantastic. Not the building itself. I mean, the shops down there, it's a bit tacky, I admit. But it's 80s. 80s were tacky. But <laughs> the green mountain you see above is a big parking structure in the center of the city.
flat iron building. I'm not sure if you know that the flat iron building actually did have fabric sun protection. On the left picture, you hardly see it. It's the only picture I could find. Very intelligent sun shading. Got demolished in the 60s, not the building, but the sun shading. And then they had all these units sticking out, air conditioning units. And now, I think 10 years ago, they fixed it again. But no sun shading to speak of. So not very intelligent, actually. Brings me to our newest ideas we work on. Not newest, but newer ideas we work on. A shading strategy. And that we started working on that mostly because of the American influence. These blinds, folding blinds, Americans usually don't like them very much for various reasons. One of them being they don't, they don't trust mechanical stuff. They think it breaks, it doesn't work, maintenance is too high, and so on. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is, unless you want to do a double facade, wind is an issue in higher buildings. It's just an issue. And I know some people say inside works also, but believe me, I've done it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So we are working on a fixed system which we have developed at a project, uh, it's a cancer research project in Lausanne for the APFL and Schuve. It's a foundation, a big comprehensive cancer center. Built in a very, cl very confined space between existing building but in a beautiful situation in the city. I don't know if you know Lausanne, it's a fantastic city, topographic fantastic city, worth a visit. So we are working on a structure that lets the ambient light in, reflects the ambient light in the depth of the building, and keeps from March till September the direct sunlight out, but lets the winter sun again in. Now the big challenge is you have to do it big enough to have a good visibility to the outside, but not too big because then it becomes brutal. It becomes a machine, no, a fixed structure. So we worked on that and we picked the exactly wrong design for that because we have many different directions and especially, we tilted the facades in many different ways. So we have overall, I think, 12 or 15 different forms we had to calculate. And we did that first because it was a competition in our office with uh, a simulation and then fine-tuned it together with uh, Badenbach Licht Labor during the design phase. And this is a test, how does it work? I mean, there's always theory and practice. Now, with daylight, I didn't mention that. The beauty of daylight is that daylight is absolute parallel, parallel rays. So you can really calculate it. With a, some people think they could simulate it with a light bulb. It doesn't work. You need the parallelity of the daylight to really work it out. And also the beauty is you can scale it. It doesn't change. So if you make the mesh bigger, you can do it deeper. It doesn't change at all. So it, we were able to prove that it works. Here were the models for it. And this is a first test mock-up in aluminium. The thing is about, I think, 180 long, 1 meter 80 long. And we are doing the same one for Adidas right now. Bigger, because it's a huge building. Very big building. There it's 6 meters long. 
And even though you can, yeah, you see it only from distance, it works as similar solution. Even if you can scale it, suddenly here we can have a folded self-supporting structure. Once you get bigger, you have a substructure that is monstrous behind this. So here, that's very light and filigree. On top, you see the view of the roof. As I said, Lausanne is worth a visit. And this is a rendering how it might appear once it's finished. Same idea, different example, where we got more industrial. That's the Harvard Alston Science Complex. It's, it's a building we do for Harvard, the School of Engineering. That's a site, it's the biggest building we ever did. It's huge. It's 1.2 billion. I mean, it's way out of whack for us. Keeps us busy since 12 years, though. <laughs> it's nice to have something like that, believe me. <laughs> so that's the whole, now let's, that's the floor plan, ground floor, and the upper floors are stringent labs. Along the same lines, we wanted to bring daylight in. We wanted to enhance daylight in the building, bring it in the depth of the building. We wanted to daylight the basement to bring light down, but without heliostats and technical means. Bartenbach simulation of the light model. And here's the idea. That's how we originally planned it. We have a grid of a foot by a two feet by two feet, 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters, where we can bounce the indirect daylight in and keep the direct daylight out, but have it big enough to see through. And to the right top, you see a model of it. In the original, it was folded elements. And then during the tender process, we said that should, it's 14,000 elements. So that should be industrial, not Yankee engineering. It should be really industrial folded. So we went to water forming, you know, from car industry, pretty much. And these are the different elements. We have, I think, 16 different elements. And these we cut also with later, this is differently. So we can make them deeper and open them more up or make them smaller and so on. And this is a real industrial product now with water forming. And this is a mock-up of the situation, how we work. I find that very interesting, especially for a school of engineering, to have something industrial, an element like that. It becomes architecturally very dominant, a very dominant architectural element. But because the buildings are so big, we wanted also to dis disturb the scale, not read the different floors, make, get it cubic. And this kind of screen makes it possible to create a volume here. Doesn't want to move, yeah. And now the last one more minute. This is in Stuttgart, and here we worked with a frit pattern. We had a height restraint, we had a certain volume, and Stuttgart is a city where you always see from above when you come to the city on the buildings. So we have the fifth facade, the roof scape. And we created here a glass roof with frit pattern very complex, and an urban facade in a height that is limited to the urban, hmm, ac by the city accepted heights, let me put it that way. I would have given it a floor more, but cities have different ideas. These are still renderings. That's the idea, and the idea is that the top part of the facade is important for the depth of the quality and depth of the light you get in the room. Then you want openings to look out, 
But we had to close 80% of the facade with a frit pattern, one way or the other, either opaque or a frit pattern. Calculations here, you see the idea. Simulations. And here the frit pattern, how we designed it. You see Grasshopper became a regular tool, tool for us architects. I have no clue, but the people in my office, they know how to do it. <laughs> I know it's great and it looks good, but nothing beyond that. Became difficult, different layers of the facade. And that's what we produced. And interesting for us architects, usually our drawings are design intent. Here suddenly at Harvard, our drawings become production. We give our drawings and we do them with Katya, with a program, machinery program. We give them to the companies and they produce with our drawings. So there is nothing in between which is something I don't like normally because of liability, but there is no other way. Same thing here with the frit pattern. And here you see the finished building, almost finished building. It's going to be, fin will be finished by the end of the month. And you see the difference, this urban facade with the depth. It's across the street from our new castle, so it has almost the baroque depth in the facade, <laughs> heaviness and depth. And then the lightness of the roof, which is also multifaceted to reflect the daylight in different ways. So when you approach the city from above, you never see in the same color and in the same reflection grade the whole building. I hope I could show you that actually the idea of daylight, of light, is really can be really a driving force in developing architecture. And I don't perceive these as restraints. I perceive that as enriching the possibilities of architecture. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.